wait aha uh -huh. and uh, yeah we are live uh hello everybody uh thank you all for uh, joining us on the week seven of game production masterclass today with us is josh and i will tell more about him later uh and to this week we will have a prototyping session which will be divided in two parts so uh, we will have one part and then the next week again it's going to be a prototyping session um this is because our team thinks that this is really like crucial and really um, important stage in the game production um and before we start with the actual lecture um i'm just gonna again uh just say thanks to all of our partners and uh, co-producers and sponsors that help uh, make this project happen um and first and foremost this is center zakreatunas which um in this project is also co-financed by European Regional Development Fund and Republic of Slovenia. And then we also have our sponsors, sponsors from industry, Outfit7 and Triterion, and our uh, partner Everis and Slovenia Games Association. Okay, now that this is uh, this little announcement is over, I have like one more small announcement. Um, the homework for week five is already, already in review. And also for week four, uh, Matteo also working on it. And you will get it like by the end of this week. Um, and now how this lecture will look like, we will have first one hour of presentation from Josh. And then uh, we will have like around 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. Where you can ask Josh anything you want, like about some tips, how to prototype or whatever you, you want to know. Um, and I also post the link with the shared notes, uh, which you are like each and every week, like populating with your own notes. And it's really cool to see how this is evolving. Um, and yeah, this is it from me. And I'll just quickly uh, introduce Josh, who also goes by the alias Stuff Wombat, and he's an indie developer. And I first, and I first know him by his game Quam. And then Gutwell, which he, he presents on Game Develop, Game Dev Days Graz. Um, and he has like a bunch of other games. I think we, he'll also talk about them, like like really like a plethora of games. Uh, it's really like, inspiring to see like in how many directions you can drive game development. So without further ado, I will give word to Josh. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah, I can see everything. Um, I'm live. Okay. Hello and welcome to the prototyping uh, session of the Masterclass program. Thanks for the introduction and the organization. Um, and also thanks to Johanna for in getting me here, basically. Um, okay. The presentation is not advancing. I'm sorry, I have a technical problem. There we go. Ah, there we go. Okay, <laughs> solved. I was in the wrong screen. Okay, hello and welcome to prototyping. Uh, let's forget the first uh, 30 seconds of this. Uh, as was said before, this is the first of two units uh, because you can never really, you cannot just make one prototype and then be done with it. It's kind of not enough. So you have to do it two times. So we do it two times. So we do one hour uh, this week and one hour next week. And so this week, I will quickly talk about what we will do, or what I will talk about. Um, first, I will talk about some dictionary stuff. I will make a dictionary definition of what is prototyping. Um, this is always a lot of fun for me <laughs> to come up with and to think about, like, oh, how do I make the words, you know, how do I make a correct definition? It can be, you know, not so interesting, but it's super important. It's extremely important because I, I look through the, the other master classes before, and there's a lot of extremely interesting stuff. And I noticed they always say, and then we make the prototype, you know, and then we make the prototype and then they move on. And it's like the prototype is like, you know, it's mentioned very quickly. I want to get really in the specifics to really explain what I think is a, is a prototype. So the first section of today will be dictionary, basically. The next section, I will try to convince you to become 
a baby again, to like regress, to stop become adult, to stop to pay taxes, to stop to, you know, put on a nice uh, suit, Google Gaga, and to experience the world with a kind of baby perspective. Um, and then in the end, I will, I will give you a map, um, which is not really true. I will actually give you a piece of paper and a pen, and then I will tell you how you can make your own map. And if this sounds very crazy and kind of esoteric, that's okay, because we have a second week, uh, which is going to be much more business, much more, you know, straightforward. We will talk about next week about application of prototyping, like actual, you know, um, kind of like not so esoteric stuff. We will go through examples. I will, I, I will just uh, tell about how I use the prototyping process, like in detail for specific games from the past. I can, I can go into um detail and did detail on that and i will you know we will talk about the big picture if now today i will talk about the dictionary and the kind of like weird stuff next week we will talk about the whole perspective and not just the tiny little dictionary entry we will see how the prototyping um connects to everything else and if you if, if today at the end of the lecture you think ah you know I really want to talk about this specific topic about prototyping. If there is something that you really want to discuss or that you want uh, input on, just tell me. I can maybe squeeze it in um, into the next lecture. I cannot change everything, but maybe I can add some stuff. So this is what we will do um, today and the next week. And now I have to quickly introduce myself and to like explain from which perspective I come from. As was said before, um, my real name is Josh, but uh, on the internet, people know me as Stuffed Wombat because I post a lot of GIFs of prototypes on Twitter. <laughs> this is why people, why majority of people know me. Then I also make some games, but majority of people know me because I have a lot of, of, of like little GIFs on Twitter. It's probably also by Johanna recommended me here because I, uh, that's kind of what I did for a long time. Um, I am an independent developer, as was said before, which means that I come from a very, very different perspective than the other people that I that I watch in the in the masterclass. When I watch this, I'm, I'm uh, very, very mind blown because the perspective of these people is very, very cool and very interesting to me, and is very much far away from how my everyday life looks. So it's a very, very interesting perspective into the kind of you know studio perspective or like a larger organization. Or like you have these kinds of people above you and you need to like convince them so that they give you give you the development time and the stuff that you need. This is very, very different from my everyday reality. And when, when Johanna asked you in the first lecture at the beginning, I didn't know, like it's a very cool with the with the quiz. When Johanna asked you what kind of like um, game, like what you want out of the masterclass, like what do your uh, what you hope to get out of it or like where you want to work afterwards. A lot of people say they want to like start a studio or work in the industry, but also a lot of people say they want to be independent. Um, and so this is kind of where I can maybe offer something, uh, a, a perspective that has not been given so, so far. And the first thing I want to say that you are never independent. I am not independent. I am interdependent, which is a horrible, horrible word. You don't want to use it in a normal conversation. You will sound very uh, like, a, like a nerd. Um, but I'm an interdependent developer. Nobody is really independent. Everyone has someone they depend on. Um, in my case, this is a circle of friends, just uh, people around me who I have known for many, many years. And we like help each other out with like jobs or with technical problems. Or if there is some interesting article that we think everyone should read, we just, you know, we share it around. We have a kind of uh, network of people who like start make games at roughly the same time. And we just talk to each other. And every indie developer has something like this. It's always a group of people around that you share and that you connect with. Um, it's never an isolated thing. And even when someone says, oh, I make the game completely alone, when they say, oh, I'm a solo developer, it's not true. <laughs> because when you ask them, oh, so you make the game completely alone, so you, you, you know, how, how, how does that work financially? And they say, oh, I live with my parents. Or, oh, uh, my girlfriend pays my bills or something like that. Even if they make every part of the game alone, there's always someone who is helping them um, to survive and like to not go crazy. Because if you're completely solo, if you're completely alone, you will go crazy. So I am an interdependent 
developer. I depend on other people and other people depend on me to a certain extent. I'm not completely alone. I made some games, um, as was mentioned before, I made Quomp, which is a Pong, but you play the ball and then you have to escape. Um, I worked on a team with that, uh, again, with, 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 some, with some cool cool people who helped me. Then some, they also helped me with Gut Whale, which was also mentioned before. Um, but my most popular work is called Hendulum. It's a browser game. It's kind of, it, it, funnily enough, it goes kind of in the direction of the hyper casual industry, but it's based in the browser. It has been played like millions of times and um, with, from, from like sh school children or something. So it's the most like played game and the game that I'm known for is not the same, but I made some games and then I made like 40, 50 other games, um, but I made a lot of prototypes for every game. Like if I do the, cal I haven't, I should have done the calculation before. I have like 60 games or something. I have probably like 10 to 100 prototypes for each game. I have a lot of prototypes that I have lying around on the hard drive or that I have like little recordings or something, like insane amount of prototypes. I put all of the, only just the GIFs, only just the videos that I put on Twitter. I took them all into a video and I put them on YouTube and the video is two hours long. So if I was very lazy, I could just say, oh, let's watch the video. And I talk about all of the prototypes. I made a lot of prototypes because I make a big mistake. I will talk about that later. Um, but I, I made a lot of prototypes, which is probably also why I'm here. And it's very, very important. I work on a low or no budget. I have never had, a, my biggest budget was 10,000 euro. And it was a huge budget for me. But it's like, like I, I think in week four, um, someone says like, oh, you know, under a hundred thousand budget, you don't even start to think, you know, I'm like very, very far below in the, in the way that I work and in the games that I make, my budgets are super, super small compared to any real uh, production, uh, which is also why I have to make a lot of prototypes. And uh, this will also be important later. So this is the perspective that I come from. I come from a kind of like a dirty indie perspective where I, I, I think like, oh, the game, you know, making games is a kind of art and I want to make games that I think is very, very important. And that means nobody gives me any money. <laughs> you know, it's very hard to convince people that they give me a budget if I say, oh yeah, marketing, I don't give a, you know, whatever, you know, I want to make a cool game. And then it's very, it becomes a lot uh, harder. It's very stupid. Um, but this is how I work and so far I can kind of survive, kind of. Again, I am dependent on other people. I have depended on other people a lot in the past. Um, so this is who I am. I am here to talk about prototypes. So now we are in the, in the part of the dictionary. Now we are in the part where I will make a very, very, um, you know, dictionary explanation of what is a prototype. Because if you say, oh, I will make a prototype and you mean a big, big area of work. So I will try to make it very precise so that we can talk next, uh, next time we can talk much more precisely and so that you have a kind of um, uh, clear perspective what I mean when I say prototype. So prototypes, prototypes are tests. They are tests that are interactive and that you throw away. And each of these three sub, sub uh, parts is extremely important. So I will talk about each of them in detail. Um, so prototypes are tests that are interactive and that you throw away. Prototypes are tests is the first uh, thing, the first headline. Um, so the thing is you want to make a new thing. That's why you are here in the masterclass. You want to make something that is not here already. This is the kind of standard of any creative work. Um, even if you want to make, you know, if you don't want to make a new game, you just want to, you know, want to build a company and provide a stable future for your employees and your family. Even if, you're, if your goal is very uh, focused on the business, you still want to make a new business. So what you want to make is currently not here. But people don't want new things. This is very, very hard. It took me many years to understand this, uh, and it makes me still extremely sad. People don't want new things. People want production value. So when I say production value, I don't just mean you throw money at it. 
it's not just you say, oh, I have $100,000 and the game assembles itself. That's, that's how you put people into crunch. That's how you, oh no, the dog, the dog, the dog also doesn't like production value. Um, but if you just put money onto the project and say, oh, it's will be production value, it's going to be good, it's not going to work out. When I say production value, what I mean is skill and craft and workmanship and dedication and persistence applied to a thing that is new. And this is extremely expensive. Like uh, the example that I, I, I every time I, I think about this, I think about Big Bang Theory, where it's like on the surface level, uh, when you talk about Big Bang Theory, it's always the same. You know, every episode is kind of like the same episode and it's always Sheldon says Bazinga and the nerds are funny and whatever. But every episode is a new episode. Every episode has a new conflict and every new episode has extremely high production value, which means that at the beginning, the conflict is introduced and then before every um, commercial break, the conflict comes to a very dramatic uh, position. And then after every commercial break, they sum up the conflict in very few sentences. And they do this so well, it's not, uh, I mean, easy or hard to notice, depends on what you pay attention to. But it's something where I realize, I think, I, I watched the show a lot and I've, uh, when I was a teenager. And I think like, oh, okay, yeah, so it's, you know, it's kind of like just a sitcom. And then I look at it closer and I realize they put a lot of work into making um, it very easy to consume. So this is the kind of production value I mean. I don't mean only CGI special effects. I mean, just care and time to make the product or the thing or the TV show or the game into something that is um, easy to consume and that gives you some sort of value as a person who watches it. So this is super expensive. This is the, this, this production value, whatever it is, you know, it's just you want to make a new thing. But if you just make the new thing, nobody will enjoy it. You need to spend a lot of time on top of the new thing to make it interesting, to make it kind of dynamic and to make it work and so to make it so that people will engage with it. Sorry. So this um, is why you need a prototype. Because you want to make something that is new, but in order to be able to make it, to like have a kind of future for it, you need to put a lot of work, a lot of money, a lot of cost on top of the new thing. So you need to check if the new thing actually works. If the new thing doesn't work, the production value on top will not be able to save it. If the new thing really works and you don't have you know, enough production value, it will also not really be a good thing. So then you need to make something that is you know, kind of geared towards the level of production value you have. This is what I say when I mean that the prototype is a test. You need to check if the new thing that you want to make has a future. And so it's not just a prototype. This is something that I also do a lot uh, because I have a very like thin skin uh, in the past, especially I, I'm working on it. Um, but what I mean with this is that when 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 uh, someone you know asks for feedback and sends me like a build or something, and I go like, okay, so I play it and I give feedback and then they say, ah, okay, yeah, but it's just a prototype, you know, it's just a prototype. It doesn't really matter because it's just a prototype. Everything will change, you know, whatever. This is crazy. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not just a prototype, it's a test. You want to test something specific so you can then put something on top of it. So treat it like a test, it's serious business. The second point from my list from before is the prototype, so to recap, prototype is a test and the prototype is interactive. This is also extremely important. Um, sorry, I have to take a sip of water. Mm. So what I say when a prototype is interactive is that I mean that you cannot just write down some idea or you cannot just say, oh, here is this kind of interaction and it will be like this and it's going to be fine. Prototypes have to be interactive. You have to touch them. You have to push a button and in the prototype there is some mechanics and the mechanics respond to you. And because they respond to you in a specific way, you have to push a different button. It's the kind of game loop. So you go and you say something and the computer says something and then, you know, and it goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. And if it's not interactive, it's not a prototype. If you cannot make it respond to you. The medium of the thing matters. This is another thing that this, I, I, I love it. It's very, very cool. I love to find connections to other media with, with video games. So if prototypes, if video game prototypes are interactive, um, 
then we can also apply the same principle to other media. You know, so we can say, okay, if we have a music and we have a music prototype, it's not called a prototype, it's called a demo. This is part of the resources I sent you. Like, what is a demo? Um, and the demo is a test to see if the new song that you make is good enough to put it into the studio. Because the studio time for a musician, if, if you're a musician, like I, I have some friends who are in a band, the time you spend in the studio to record a song with the sound engineers and all of the technology is extremely expensive. It's the production value. It's the thing that makes it so that you can listen to it on the radio. A few people say, okay, whatever, they don't care about polish, but it's not a large enough group to pay your rent. <laughs> so, is it, this is, this is the, so the demo tape is the kind of test of the music to see if it's worth it to put it into the studio and to put all of the uh, expensive stuff on top of it. For a painting, you have a sketch, you know. For a website, you have a kind of prototype as well. And it's very interesting because websites and music use the same words to describe the, the range of the prototype, like how expensive the prototype itself is. So if you make a lo-fi prototype for a website, um, occur according to the research that I did on this, um, you call, if you just take a bunch of pieces of paper and order them in the kind of direction that you click on the website and that the website changes, it's called a lo-fi prototype. And then if you put it actually into the code, it's a high, high fidelity prototype, exactly like you have lo-fi and high, fi high fidelity music. So the thing is, the kind of strange thing is that the media matters. So the type of interaction that you are prototyping um, just needs to be expressed in the prototype. So if you make a board game, if you make a video game that follows the rules of a board game, but you want to make it as a video, video game because it's easier to sell it on Steam, then you can just make your prototype as a board game. You can just say, OK, so I'm making Settlers of Catan, the video game. So I just make Settlers of Catan and try it out. You know, I can just do it in real time. It's faster because the faster it is, the cheaper it is, and the better you can test this stuff. So the prototype has to be interactive, not only because um, it matters to the medium, but because the emergent behaviors are unpredictable. Emergent behaviors is not just in Dwarf Fortress or something where, you know, the cat licks the puddle and then gets... Uh, dies from alcohol poisoning or something because of some strange connections. Emergent behaviors happen at a very, very low level, at a very, very basic, basic, simple level. Like this, for example. This is a great example. If you look at my slides, you can see that they every time I, I press one new bullet point pops up. I do this because I think it's the best way to, to make a presentation because I can focus on each point and then they all come together to one coherent thing. But there is an emergent behavior here that I did not test for because I did not uh, do enough prototyping on the slides, which is, of course, a horrible thing to do. Because what you can see is that when I, when I press now, the size of the font changes. So all of my good intentions about, oh, you, you will see every point and it will pop up and it will be very easy to understand, I destroy it. <laughs> I realize this too late. I cannot uh, fix it because I did not test, because uh, when I make the slides, I just have the whole slides written out, and then afterwards I copy paste and delete the individual points. So this is, you know, I make a perfectly uh, stupid mistake because I don't take prototyping seriously enough, even though I'm here to tell you about it, um, which is also a good point. It's, yeah, it, it happens to everyone, which is what I have to say to excuse my, my shitty planning. Um, but the important point is that the emergent behavior, like I just showed you, can happen at the at the low, low level of a PowerPoint slide. So if you don't make it interactive, if you don't make it actually like it will be in the final product, but cheaper, you will run into stupid problems like this presentation has now. The most important thing about prototypes being interactive is that your ideas are not real until they are playable. Your video game ideas are not real until they are playable. I just yesterday, funnily enough, I'm in a Discord server and some person, uh, is, is, is saying, is, is talking about like keeping notes. And they say, oh yeah, does anyone else have the problem where they look at their uh, like little notebook and they look at the idea from like two weeks ago for a game and you have no clue what it means? Because you look at it and it says like, oh, Super Mario jump slide Goomba. And it makes perfect sense in the moment, but because it's not the actual medium that you're working in, that you have to work in, 
so much gets lost in translation. So you can have the idea, but it's not real until you can actually play it, until you can actually see it. So I have the idea, oh, the slides are going to be cool. And then I make it and suddenly it's fucking horrible. I'm very sorry about this. <laughs> so prototypes are not only tests, they are interactive tests because video games are interactive and you're testing for a video game. And prototypes are thrown away. This is perhaps the most important point in the whole presentation. This is really, really crucial to me. This is very, very important. I'll take a sip of water again. Mm. Because you need information, not code. When you make a prototype, you are testing your interactions. You're not testing your ability to make a code. You're not testing your ability to sit down on the computer for four hours. You need information about the inf interactions that you're making. You don't want to keep, like, of course, if, if, if it works out perfectly and the prototype is perfect and the code is also perfect, you can keep it, of course. But the primary goal is not to prototype some code, it's to prototype information. Because with the information, you can make a new code that takes that information into account. If you need the code, then you are not prototyping anymore. You are in production. If you cannot throw away the code that you're making, then you're not prototyping. If you say, oh, I will make a prototype, but it has to be good because otherwise, you know, we will get into trouble with the deadlines. It's not really a prototype. You're just producing stuff. This is very, very deep to my heart. Of course, you don't need to actually throw it away. Actually, you should keep it in a folder so you can look at it later. Um, but the idea is that you don't just build on top of the prototype. Because the information you get from a prototype is also engine agnostic to some degree. What I mean with this is that I can make a prototype in Twine, which is a, a game engine that is very fast for, for dialogue driven stuff. And I can test the kind of dialogue interactions. And then I can say, okay, this works. And so now I take this kind of like interaction pattern and I put it into Unreal Engine. And the cost of putting it into Unreal Engine is pretty high but the cost of putting it into Twine is pretty low. So if I, if, I, if I say, oh, I know, I have to start in Unreal Engine because I need the code, then suddenly you look at a much higher, type, a much higher cost of prototyping. Um, you need the information, you don't need the code, and be very careful about social media because social media is death. This is a kind of like a sneaky point. I said before that I make so many prototypes because I make a mistake. This is the mistake. Um, if you put something on social media, um, it's very, very easy that you will uh, get eaten by the social media. Because what happens, what happened to me was that I confused marketing with development. And confuse is a great word. I love it. Because confuse is a combination of two words. The first word is com, which means like together. And fuse means like kind of like melting. So confuse is not just like when I say I am confused, I'm not just like, oh, where am I? You know, what's going on? You can also, when you confuse two things, you literally put them together. You think they're one thing. And suddenly you think development is marketing. And suddenly you think marketing is development. And so you sit down and you say, oh, today I will make a prototype that will about, be about petting the dog. And it will be very funny. And I will put it on social media and I will get many tweets, you know. It's not bad, but if you do this, you are not making a prototype anymore. You're making marketing, which is important. You know, you should do marketing, um, but keep it separate or it will eat you because marketing is so much stronger in terms of reward than a prototype. When you get the likes on Twitter, this is what happened to me. I got the likes on Twitter and I was like, oh, I get likes on Twitter. I'm a good developer. Oh, that's great. You know, let's make some more, you know, suddenly. I need some more, I need some more. And then, you know, I, I, I start to make a prototype, but really it's just a video for Twitter. And this is why I have two hours of video that I put on Twitter. And if I, if I would have spent all of this time on actually prototyping, on actually testing stuff out, I would have, I would, I would have done so much more stuff <laughs> because I spent so much time um, confusing development and marketing where I think that I'm making a game, but actually I'm just making a GIF for Twitter. Um, I quickly have to check the time. We are very far behind. Uh, that's interesting. Every time I test this, I was uh, had, I had too little material. Okay. 
<laughs> so prototypes are interactive tests that you throw away. This is the dictionary entry. In my personal dictionary, I, I love to make up words and stuff. It's very fun. In my personal dic dictionary, prototypes are interactive tests that you throw away. And this is the kind of thing, if you take one thing away from, 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 from the lecture, please try to remember this. I think this is really, really true. Um, so when someone says they're making a prototype, or like when you want to make a prototype, consider doing it like this. Another quick side point, uh, because it, it comes up again and again in the writing of this, is like the difference between a prototype and a game jam. Because game jams are not prototypes. Um, a game jam, the point of the game jam, is the, to make the whole development process. You just make it faster. But the, the point is, it's, it's, a, it's a stupid thing where I get angry that people don't use words correctly. It's, it's stupid. It's my personal problem. But uh, now it's your personal problem because this is my, my class. <laughs> um, in game jams, most of the time of development is spent on what I called before production value. So when someone says, oh, we made a prototype for a game jam, it's kind of not really true because they make a prototype and then they put a lot of production value on the prototype. They just do that in 48 hours. They just do that in a very short period of time. So the, the 444 rule is from Rami Ismail. It's also one of the things that I send out. Um, what it means is that when you have a game jam with two days of time, what you do is you spend four hours on the prototype. You spend four hours on making tests and throwing them away and making interactive tests that you then throw away. Um, and then you spend 44 hours polishing it and putting production value in. Which means, you know, it means like making a new level, making more puzzles, putting cool animation, sound effect, you know. But you work with this thing that you make in the four hours. You work with this, with this. You make it deeper. You don't just add stuff on top of it. You don't just prototype on top of the prototype on top of the prototype. You just polish the prototype because you add production value. And then the two, uh, two days are over and you have a game jam. So game jam is not a prototype. It's the whole development process. Again, this is just my fight against the way words are used. Um, yes, I, I was wrong. I, I, I thought I have to drink uh, water only here, but this is the third break already. This is another emergent behavior of me being nervous. Um, so this, is, this was the first part. The first part is where I make a dictionary and I'm angry about how people use certain words. Uh, this part is over now. Uh, don't worry. Now, now we will talk about the baby stuff, which is even weirder. Um, so, how do you prototype? Um, this is probably what you actually want to know. <laughs> um, how to prototype is that you pick something that you want to test, then you test it, and then you throw it away, and you get information. You know, hopefully, you learn something new from it. You don't just throw it away, even if you just learn that you know this kind of thing does not work. So the big question is, what are you testing? You know, um, what specific thing do you test for? You can test for something specific, like uh, can I can I make a player retention time of like you know, CPI or whatever? I don't know the words. Sorry, uh, the, the other people already have very good specific testing vocabulary um, that they use. Or you can you can test for something specific, or you can test for eh, like whatever. Right, you can go like the yeah, you know, I don't really care what I'm testing for, and this is kind of in violation of what I said before about prototypes being tests. But this goes deeper because you're not just um, testing nothing. When you're just, you, you can also just test like the fundamental nature of video games, which is so strange and convoluted that we need a metaphor to explain it. Um, so let's imagine you are on an island and you are surrounded by the ocean. The island is like, like I'm standing right now, you know, it's a solid ground, so I don't have to spend a lot of energy. If I was standing in the water right now, I'd have to constantly like swim. I would have to uh, drink even more water because it's even more exhausting. Um, but we are on an island and around us is the ocean. And the thing about the ocean is it's fucking scary. You know, there's like, the, it, there's like a kind of slope, you know, like it's, it's like the sand goes into the ocean and it's kind of nice. And then suddenly the floor drops away. And there's just darkness down there and you don't know what is what is there and it's something is moving and you just you want to go back to the island i fucking hate the ocean it's very very scary but you have a boat 
And the boat is a kind of like, you know, it's kind of like a land that you can carry with you. So you can get in the boat and you're safe. You don't have to like, you know, look down at the sharks and the monsters and the lizard people and whatever. Um, so you get on the boat and you ride out into the ocean. Okay, this is the kind of metaphor scenario. We, we leave the island, we leave, we leave the nice, comfortable place, and we go out into the ocean. Why do we do this? It seems kind of stupid. Maybe we have a goal. Maybe we need to get some food from another island. Maybe we need to find some new people because we're all alone on our current island. Um, you know, we have a specific goal. We have a kind of desire that we want to, to meet. This is when, when I say, okay, can I make a game that uh, keeps the attention of people for like 10 minutes? is a concrete thing you want to achieve or you want to explore. If everything is okay on your island, but you just want to see the world, you just want to taste the, the wind on your tongue, you want to feel the salt water on your hands, you just want to go, you know? There's nothing you really want to achieve, you just want to go out in the world and kind of see what's going on there. And so the question is to how, how, how are you prototyping? How do you prototype? You can prototype directed. You can prototype in a directed way where you have a clear goal and you know, I want to go to this island over there because they have a resource that I can trade with them and I need to do that so, so that I can get medicine. It's a concrete goal. It's a concrete prototype. I want to test uh, if my platforming behavior is understandable by four-year-old children. You know, it's a specific test. Or you can go explore. You can make an exploratory prototype where you don't really know where you want to go. There is no clear goal on the horizon. You just want to test the whole world. You want to test everything. You don't really have a clear destination. I expressed this on my only graphic in the whole talk, uh, which is a sliding scale. Sliding scales are great. You can, you, can, you can express the whole world if you have enough sliding scales. It's a wonderful thing. Um, so on the right side, I think I have to do it like this. On the right side of the sliding scale, you have the directed types of prototyping. So this is what we will talk about next week. Um, this is the directed type of prototyping, which you know, it makes sense. It's a good idea. It gets results and it works. Because when you make a clear test with a clear goal and you fail, you still can learn something. And then on the other side, on the other side, there's the exploratory prototyping. Um, which is the kind of, you know, irresponsible, it's kind of like, like what, what the teenagers want to do. They want to go out and they just want to disappear into the forest. And it's also a kind of a luxury because it means that you don't have, you don't, you don't need the medication. You don't need the food from the other island. You're kind of in a position of comfort um, and you go out and do something that's kind of stupid, but it's also extremely important. It's the kind of thing where like, you know, if you're struggling every day to like put the food on the table, you cannot take the time to do the vital stuff, to do the very important stuff that is uh, beneficial in the long term. This is exploratory prototyping. I have no solution for like have not having enough resources. I can just say that it's very important. And if possible, um, I want to convince you to make time for this kind of exploring prototyping. But what, what do I mean specifically? This is all, you know, very, very strange and vague. Um, I have now a red arrow on the, on the, on the prototyping uh, scale which will start at the extreme end, at the extreme version of exploratory prototyping. This is so extreme, it's actually impossible. Um, and this is what I call childlike prototyping. This is where I say in the beginning, oh, you, I want you to become like a baby. I want you to try to become a baby again in your prototyping. Um, sorry, I'm getting Discord messages. Um, I want you to become a baby again in your prototyping. So what that means, and now I have to click here again. I want you to become a baby again, which means to reject all patterns and structures. Often when you start to make a prototype or when you sit down to make a prototype, what happens to me in the beginning a lot was like, oh, I want to make a prototype and I want to make, you know, a game like Mario or like Zelda, or I want to make a shmup, you know, and you kind of have all of these patterns and structures and you have like, oh, you know, like Dark Souls kind of healing items, and it's going to be great. And you have this whole huge idea in your head that you cannot really express. But if you are a baby, you have no clue how the world works. You don't know anything about Dark Souls healing patterns, you know? You have no clue. So what you do is you just do stuff. You crawl around on the floor, 
which in terms of this metaphor <laughs> means that you open up your engine and you just put an object in and then you put some code in and then you see what happens you know like when a baby crawls on the floor and picks up some spoon and goes like oh you know and tries to grab it and even grabbing is hard because you don't really know what you're doing but you just do whatever you know um you sit down and you start making whatever i did this today in the morning i just sat down i was like yeah do, 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 do. And 30 minutes later, I had a very <laughs> horrible game. Um, but I will, I will talk about uh, the long-term benefits of this later. But what this means is that you say, Google, Gaga, I don't know anything. I forget everything I know about video games. I just sit down and I make something. This is the extreme version of exploratory prototyping. Google, Gaga. It's very important. It's very hard. But uh, if, you, if you have the time, try to become a baby. Um, then if we, if we say, okay, this is kind of extreme, this is very, very strange, let's talk about technology-driven prototyping, um, where if we go to the baby, baby metaphor again, it means that you are now, you know, you kind of know what is up and down, and now you find a toy. You find like a, one of these like building blocks, and then you can put two of them together, um, and you have something concrete that you latch onto. So what I mean with this is that you don't just sit down and open whatever and go like, ooh, 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 but you like, take something that you like are interested in, some sort of technology, some sort of engine, some sort of framework that you're interested in, and you just go ahead. You just sit down and play with it. You just type some stuff in and you see what happens. Because every toy, every engine, every tool has a kind of texture, has a kind of direction to it. I mentioned before Twine. Twine is made for uh, interactive choose your own adventure games. So if you play around with it, you will automatically be forced in the direction of this um, interactive choice thing. Unreal Engine uh, is, is tooled in the direction of 3D uh, games with shiny surfaces. So if you just play around with that, you will go in this direction. But it's not like you want to go somewhere, you just follow the engine. You just follow the flow of your tools. So you pick a toy and a tool and you just go. This is kind of more reasonable than becoming a baby. And then, you know, almost, almost getting into the territory where it's kind of becomes like, like too solid and, and too directed. We have a theme driven prototyping where you think in a specific direction. You don't sit down immediately. You think in a specific direction and then you work towards that. Now, this is kind of how a game jam works. But again, game jam is not a prototype. Um, what I mean is that sometimes uh, I did this. This is the one hour game jam or like the game a week that I also send out they force you to kind of work very quickly with this because you have very, very little time. And so you need to be, be fast on your feet to like translate a theme into like something that you want to work on. So what I do is I sit down and say, I want to make something about sunsets. And then I'm guided by the feeling of the sunset. This is again, super esoteric, right? But it's, it kind of limits the scope of the stuff that I can do. And it still doesn't give me a concrete goal. It's not telling me make a game about sunsets uh, that people will want to replay, you know, five times every day. I just go and explore what it means to make a game about a sunset. And I explore the thematic range of this thing. And I will discover stuff that I never even thought about um, without this kind of like loose, loosey-goosey prototyping. I call it like poetry prototyping. And then in the middle, right, right between the, between the two extremes, between like being a baby and, and making money. <laughs> I think this, is, this, would have been, ah, this would have been a much better uh, name for the two categories. But right in the middle is the idea-driven prototyping, which is the kind of like most standard thing, where you sit down and you go like, okay, I have this idea. I want to make something that's kind of like the Dark Souls and kind of like Zelda. And then it's like, oh, oh uh, you're kind of losing the, the, the spirit of just going, you know, of just going exploring because you already have a kind of direction. You already have a kind of destination in mind. And this is dangerous because it will kind of like limit the horizon. It will limit the amount of stuff, the amount of areas that you can explore. Um, but if you don't think about it too much, it's still, it's still cool in, from, from my perspective, right? If you say like, I want to I wanna make, make a game that's kind of like Dark Souls, and then you don't think, you know, the next five sentences, but just sit down and go crazy, I, I, I think that's still cool. Um, as long as you don't get too specific. So this is the kind of range of exploratory prototyping, which is a lot of kind of crazy stuff. And like, I want you to become like a baby. I want you to become a poet. I want you to just follow the tool, you know, and to not get too specific in your prototyping. This is kind of strange, right? 
Um, but the biggest risk of explore, uh, exploratory prototyping, the worst thing that can happen when you do this, is that your prototype is great. Because then you don't throw it away. If you go exploring and you find something and you think it's amazing and you latch onto it and you don't let go, then you add more stuff to it and you add more stuff to it. And four years later, it's bloated and unfocused and you have wasted four years of your life. The biggest risk of exploratory prototyping is not that you become like a baby and kind of like lose your ability to walk and talk. The biggest risk is that you find something that you don't want to let go. Um, this is the kind of worst thing that can happen. But there is also short-term costs associated with becoming a baby because what you will produce will probably be horrible by your standards. What you will produce will be kind of the worst thing that you ever made. And you're like, why did this guy want me to become a baby? This is horrible. This is a garbage product. I cannot sell this, you know. This is why it's a luxury because the time you invest doesn't immediately lead to a payoff. It doesn't lead to a product. It doesn't lead to something you can iterate on. It's useless. What the fuck is this? I hope it's okay to curse. I think it's okay to curse. <laughs> I should have asked before. It's, but you, you make something that's useless. But you only wasted a few hours. You only wasted a few hours instead of taking something and thinking, oh, it's so great, you know, I will make this and I will love it. And four years later, it, it's, it's garbage. So the short-term costs of exploratory prototyping is that you cannot turn it into money immediately. But it has long-term gains, long-term profits, long-term benefits. This is why I, I, I put so much focus on this because this is something that I experience for myself. And this is what I hope to pass on to you, that doing this kind of like exploratory stuff, like doing very, very fast, quick, dirty prototypes and throwing them away has long-term benefits. The first and most obvious is that you will become faster and faster and faster and faster at prototyping. You will become extremely fast if you spend enough time on this. I cannot recommend you to spend like all of your time on it. There are some other things like we will discuss next time that you should pay attention to, but you will get faster and faster and faster. Your experience will compound and like build on top of each other and you will just become a fast prototyper, which is going to be very important in the long term. Another thing that happens is that you will develop a sort of style because one time you make a kind of mistake in the code or something strange happens and you think that's kind of cool and then you put it in the next one, but this time it's intentional. And then before you know it, you know, people recognize your games just from the gameplay, just from the way it feels to move a character. Because you have a kind of personal style that you have developed over time. And you will also gain a library of old ideas. This is maybe the best benefit. Um, it's very, very useful. Um, as, uh, one of the videos I sent out in preparation is from Cactus, who is like the most legendary prototyper uh, or like fast game developer. I don't know if he considers it prototypes. Um, but he made so many games and most of them are absolute trash. And I think he kind of agrees with that. I don't know. I, I, I shouldn't talk about it. I shouldn't presume anything about Cactus. I have no clue what he thinks or what he feels. He just has made a lot, a lot of games. And then in the interview that is part of the, of the, of the material that was sent out, um, he's asked by an interviewer, um, so tell me about the inspiration for Hotline Miami, because he made Hotline Miami eventually together with a friend. Um, so the interviewer asks him, so what was, you know, tell me about the beginning of Hotline Miami. And what he says is so mind blowing because he says, oh, it was a prototype I made five years ago. Five years since you make the first prototype and since you make Hotline Miami. It's a long, long distance. And then, of course, you have, you know, like millions of prototypes that don't become Hotline Miami. But five years is such a long time. This is what I say before with like, if it's not playable, it's not real. Because if you write down in your notepad app, oh, I want to make a top-down shooter game where it's very brutal. And you look at that five, five years later, you have no clue what specifically you mean. But if you play Cocaine Cowboy, then you have a kind of idea, you know, how does it feel? Is this maybe a little bit too slow? You have something concrete that you can work with. And you have many, many, many of these things. If you do exploratory prototyping, most of it will be horrible. And in some of it, there will be something that's very interesting. And the thing is, 
you know, this is supposed to be masterclass. I, I'm supposed to tell you something that is very valuable for you. I cannot teach this to you. Nobody can teach this to you. Nobody can teach you how to become faster and faster and faster. Nobody can teach you how to have your own style. And nobody can give you a library of old ideas. This is something that you accumulate over time. This is a long-term gain process. What I can try to pass on to you is the understanding of the fundamentals, a kind of shortcut to the understanding the fundamentals of how video games work at a very, very basic level. Because when you have your island and you have the ocean around it and you go exploring and your ship sinks, you know, it's a metaphor so you don't die, and your ship sinks and you do it again and again and again and again and again, you get a kind of idea of what is around the island. You get a kind of understanding, you know, what is out there, what, what you know, what, what kind of stuff usually happens in games. You get a kind of feeling, a kind of understanding for the fundamentals. And this is essentially, I mean, this is a big claim. <laughs> I have so far, I have found it to be almost uh, universal for m any type of game that works in a similar uh, possibility space. So I do this a lot in 2D. Uh, in, in, in the two-dimensional possibility space, but you can translate it to 3D. What I mean is, um, I cannot teach you how to be faster. I cannot give you a style. I cannot, you know, give you my library of old prototypes and expect you to use them um, in the same way that I could use them. But I can tell you how to make a map of the possibility space. I can tell you how you can understand the kind of basic stuff that is around you. It's a quick water drinking time again. This is water, by the way. Uh, <laughs> um, yes. So this is the last part. This is the part where I said, I will give you a pen and a paper in the end, and you can make a map. Um, this is the, the kind of accumulation of all of this stuff, but it's also just a discrete own thing that I can try to pass on to you. Um, so when you have the map of the possibility space, you know kind of what's around you. You know the kind of interactions that are around you. You know the kind of stuff that always happens when you go exploring. Because at first you have to put an object down, and then you have to put a little bit of code down, and then you have to put an interaction with the code and the object. And there is not infinite amounts of, of interactions that can happen. They all fall into some sort of category. So you have an action, and you have a reaction that makes the interaction. And this kind of map of the possibility space tries to make you, to, to, to help you to find interactions around you. Because you can then take the interaction and you can use it in many different ways. It's a kind of like a Lego block that you can put into, any, into many, many, many different projects. Um, it's a creativity exercise and a help for prototyping. And funnily enough, yesterday a friend told me, this exists already. I was thinking like, oh, this is so cool. This is so new. You know, I have found something that's very useful. It's apparently called a morphological matrix. Uh, <laughs> and I look it up and it looks uh, kind of similar. Um, but this is, a, is, a, is, a, is I, I always love it when, 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 when uh, you make something that already exists, you know, based on like a lot more thoughtful research by other people, but the general direction is the same. So it's, it's kind of nice. You can look up morphological matrix. It's, it's, a, medium, it's a more medium agnostic type of prototyping help. Um, so this is the last part. This is also the homework. Uh, so I would encourage you to pay uh, attention. Um, how do you make a map of a space that's not real? You know, the ocean is a metaphor, of course, so it's not really there. Um, so this is a how to map out the possibility space around your game. The first step is that you make a list of all the objects in your game. This means like, okay, so I have an object, you know, it's a bottle, and I have an object that's the player character, and I have the object of the microphone. This is a stupid example. Let's say <laughs> uh, you have a platforming character, and you have some tiles, and you have some spikes, and you have a goal. These are the objects. It's the kind of sprites, the colliders uh, in the game engine. And then you list all of the actions that you have in the game. And you have to be careful not to get too complicated here. When I say action in the game, what I mean is I press a button. This is an action. So how many buttons can I press? In my example, I can press the right, left, and the up key. So I can go right, I can left, and I can, I can go jump. But you have to abstract it and say the action is actually pressing the key. You know, this is an action. But also, 
it's a, a, an action is something that happens inside of the game engine. So an action could also be the player lands on the ground, because this is something that you can use as a trigger for a reaction. So a possible reaction, this is the most limited part of this map, because there is only a limited amount of things that objects in game engines can do. You know, they have a sort, they, ha they, they have a position, so they can move, they can change the position. They have an angle, so they can change the angle, and they have a scale, so they can grow or they can shrink. And then they can disappear, or they can, you know, they can appear, they can get spawned. But there is a kind of physical limitation to what objects in a game engine can do. And this applies to, to 2D and 3D. Um, you have to work a little bit harder to translate it into narrative stuff. Uh, I work primarily in 2D, so this is my example. Um, so you list all the objects, you list all the actions, and you list all the possible reactions. And then you combine them at random to create interactions. You just pick, it's, 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 it's like those Facebook quizzes, where it's like, take the first letter of your name and the first letter of your last name, and this is your superhero name. It's kind of like this, but it's for game design. Um, so for example, I can say I have a player with tiles, spikes, and a goal. My actions are pressing a button, but my action can also be if the player is very close to the goal, you know, if, if there is a certain distance. You can, it's, it's, it's just logic checks, basically. And then the reactions, can be that you destroy something, that something moves away or towards something, that it jumps, that it wins, you know, that you get to the next level, you can grow, rotate, etc. Very basic stuff, but you can already kind of reverse engineer, like for example, the Boo, uh, the Shy Guys from Super Mario. You can kind of reverse engineer their behavior out of this simple list. So for example, what I say when I say, uh, you will have to make interactions uh, in a document and send them to me. So what I mean is that you know, one interaction can look like this. I can say, okay, I have a player and the player lands on the floor. And when the player lands on the floor, the reaction is that the spikes will jump up in the air. Already, it is a puzzle game because when you land on the floor, the spikes jump up so you can run under them. You know, it's an interaction. Is it a great interaction? You will have to test it. But now you have something concrete that you can test. Or what if the player jumps? Every time when you use the jump button, the spikes will get taller. So you suddenly you can only jump like five times, or maybe you want to jump 10 times because the spike will hit the enemy. But if you reverse it to these kind of basic blocks, it's very kind of like fast to generate these ideas because you just know the little, the, like the space that is around you, and then you make a little connection between the specific concepts. You can say, okay, when the player moves, then the goal moves away from the player, you know? And suddenly you have a whole game that's basically already Again, because the goal just runs away from you and you have to kind of like sheep herd it so that it cannot run away and then you can touch it and you can win. Or you can say there is no action and the spikes move towards the player. Again, this is like the most basic platforming mechanic is that there is a bad thing that always goes to you. But now you have it summed up in a, sim in a simple sentence and it's removed from all of the kind of expensive production value stuff. It doesn't have a sprite. It doesn't have like a whole voice actor or something attached to it. It's just a single line. It's just a single sentence. So you just take an action and a reaction, and that makes the interaction. You can sum it up in one line, or you can draw it as a mind map. Um, I like the, the writing in one line better because it's faster. Uh, but if you want, you can draw a mind map where you have like one circle, and then it says like player, you know, and then it's like, press the up key and then you have a kind of like matrix of like possible reactions and it's it looks like a crazy tree um so this is how you use the map of the space that's not real you list all the objects in your game you list all the actions in your game you list the possible reactions and then you combine them at random to create an interaction and then you have this long list of like stupid strange stuff and then you can put the ones that seem cool and you can put them in the engine and you can test them. And suddenly you can test a lot of mechanics. You can test a lot of stuff. This is how I basically, this is basically how I made the mechanics for Quant. This is how I'm currently making the mechanics for Gebala. It's a very, very fast process. And once you do it a couple of times, it just is in your head. and You don't even need the map anymore. But for now, this is the homework um, for today because I think we are done with the time. Yeah. Um, so the homework is to map out the possibility space of your game, or like if you have a game, 
uh, that you want to make or of a basic platformer if you don't have a game that you want to make. So, you know, a basic platformer has a player, it has tiles, it has spikes, and it has a goal. Um, this should be a pop-up somewhere now or whatever. Um, I can send it later again. And then write 15 unique interactions in the one sentence format. If you really want to make a mind map, uh, that's okay. 15 unique interactions. It sounds like a lot, it's nothing. It will go very easily. Um, and it does not matter if you think that they are bad or good or whatever. Just try to think in this way of like little things that you can connect um, because this is, you know, it's a map. It's about seeing connections. It's about thinking creatively um, because this will help you a lot in your test. And it's like, oh no, oh damn. Ah, this is not exploring at all. This is not fun, you know, I'm not a baby. I'm making a plan. I have like a kind of list thing. Ugh. You know, I kind of like, I wanted you to explore and, and like be free. But the things I cannot, I cannot teach that. You have to do that yourself. Um, because maybe becoming a baby is kind of impossible. I don't know, but you have to try it yourself. Next time we will try to become adults instead of becoming a baby. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, if there are questions, I will have answers. Uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, this is quite a nice presentation. And we can write, first jump into the questions about the homework. Yes. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, this is the first question. Can you see it or uh, should I read it out? How much should the list go into detail? Should the list only include objects that are seen in the UI or also objects that are there for logic? This is an interesting question. It's if you can make it so that I can understand what's going on in one sentence, then include the, the, the logic objects as well. Um, if you write the sentence and you think that this makes no sense and you cannot understand it, then don't. <laughs> OK, cool. Uh, thank you. And the next question also about the homework is oh, no. <laughs> uh, this one. Are we providing only a write-up or can we also do sketches or similar? The thing is, um, this is the, if you want to do a sketch, you know, if this is how you think or like how, how, it, how it becomes real for you, do a sketch. Um, I'm interested in the most kind of basic, simple um, sentence. If you also send me a sketch, cool. It will take a, a more time and will not be as kind of crazy and expansive. Okay, I think that uh, that's all the questions about the homework. Um, Shapey and Prasenia, please tell us if that's, that, that clarifies all of, all of the things. And we will jump right to next question. No more <laughs> about the topic of this, this masterclass. Okay, I accidentally turned off my second monitor just now. Oh, there we go. Social media is death, but where do you find willing testers that provide actual valuable feedback? Um, this is the circle of friends I said in the beginning. Um, if you post something on social media, or at least from my, from my perspective, my experience for posting on social media is that the people I reach are game developers. Unless it goes really viral, then you can reach, it's very funny. You can see like the different communities that the viral tweet goes through. Like you can reach the furries and then the Japanese people wake up and then it's the Spanish community, whatever. Um, but you will not find good feedback on social media. You will find interest in the fantasy. You will see if someone is like, oh, this looks very cool, I want to play it. But if someone like, people don't go on Twitter to provide game development critique. If you want to find people that can help you to, with, with play testing, the best way to do that is to, to find like a, a smaller community, like, like uh, your community, for example. You have meetups I saw on YouTube. You can probably go there and meet people and if you, you know, if, if you test their games, they will also test your games. It's what I mentioned in the beginning with the interdependence. Like if you have people around you um, that you help, then they will also help you as well. And it's much more useful to get feedback from people who are on your level um, than feedback from people who are like CEO of Blizzard because they live in a different world. They have no idea like what scale you're working on. Perfect. I think that's a really perfect answer. Yeah, <laughs> and we, we and we used to have yeah, and we used, used to have like uh, this kind of like uh, bring your games from game jams or like like 
test out. Uh, I think we will we will revive this concept again in, in, uh, in summer. <laughs> it's summer. yeah, it's hard to show people the stuff, but yeah, it's yeah. it's strange. I don't know. I can really I can really really recommend to just find people who are on the same kind of like development time as you. So if you are making games for two years on the side, find people who are in the same position, because uh, then you will spend a lot less time arguing about the basics of like how you work, right? <laughs> mm. If you uh, talk to someone who is a professional indie developer with a big budget, they will tell you that you should do more testing, whereas you're QA and you're like, oh, I'm one guy, I have no money. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> your level is the best way to test, I think. Cool. Uh, next question. You have very interesting names for your games. Do you have names for your prototypes? Are names important for your game slash prototypes? This is a great question. I used to be very obsessed with finding names for the games that are kind of impossible to pronounce. I was, this is like not like the gut whale and stuff is kind of okay. But if you look at my older stuff, it has some extremely strange names, um, which makes them very hard to talk about <laughs> so i cannot re if, if 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 you want to talk with investors about your game they should be able to pronounce it it's very hard when the first question in a like funding meeting is so do you say like comp or quomp or like what is it and you're like you have to express kind of a weird thing to do um for the prototypes i don't have names for the prototypes most of the i guess i do there's a, there's always this interesting there's always a switch in the in the prototyping process where i make a project and then I pick it up again later. There's a long, this is what I will talk about next time. There's long distances often between making a prototype and then going in that direction again. Um, and then I will give them a name at some point in that process. When I feel it's become very concrete, I will give it a name. And then maybe the name will evolve with every kind of prototyping iteration. <laughs> cool. <laughs> the, first version, the first version is always called like gobble <laughs> do like just smash on the keyboard and like, yes yeah <laughs> okay perfect uh and the next question is how do we transition from theme driven prototyping to actions and interactions this i had to cut this because of the uh because of the time because i was taking uh, longer than i thought i had an example where it's like if if if, if the theme is like you know holding hands um then the first thing that pops into my mind, right? I don't think for something. It's just that you have two hands on the screen like this. And then it's like, okay, so I have the two hands on the screen. So what happens now? And I just put some random control in it, right? So I say, this hand is always moving like this. And then when I press a button, it will go forward, you know? And I, I don't really think. I just go like, okay, so the goal is obviously to do this, you know? But then if it's a two-player game, both of them, and then you have to kind of like with a second person next to you, you have to press the button at the same time and you will hold the hand. And that's suddenly a mechanic. And I, you know, this kind of thinking is to some degree dependent on the understanding that you can press a button and anything can happen. You know, so this is why you become a baby at first, where you go like, I go to the very, very basics, where you press the button that the screen like dies because the CPU overloads. So it's, it's a kind of like you just go forward and you use the kind of building blocks of the map around you to, to make the interactions. This is, this, is, this, is, this is why it's very hard to, to, to teach this kind of intuitive stuff because you just do it a hundred times and then you get very fast at doing it. That's, yeah. <laughs> uh, and next question from the from same, same person. Not potential. Uh, yeah, sorry. And if I understand correctly, the point of exploratory prototyping is just practice, not actual potential game in the future. It's not good to like the created prototype. It's not bad to like the created prototype. Uh, I was maybe too negative. <laughs> this is, I have just seen it happen so many times that someone is like, I want to test out this new feature of Unity. You know, like I just bought this, this plugin, so now I can have two controllers and both have good controls. And you buy it and you build something and you don't let go. And you just build on top, on top, on top. But what you should do is at some point stop, put it away, and look at it again later. This is, again, this is 
uh, the kind of problem of having it in two ways. The longer term benefits of the exploratory thing also depend on the on the next lecture. But uh, the point of exploratory prototyping is just practice. It's not only practicing, but also kind of building this, this intuitive understanding for the future, like step by step. And this means that you make a shitty thing and you make a shitty thing, you make a shitty thing, you make a really cool thing, and then you try to make it into a big thing and you kind of fail. And then two years later, you pick it up again. And then you pick it up again. Like the game that I'm working on now, like the, that is in commercial production, at the end of commercial production, actually, I first prototyped it eight months ago. And I make the prototype complete, and I really like it, but then I kind of put it away in a box. And two months later, I take it out again and redo it from scratch with a different changes because then I can, and now I know in which direction the systems go. And I know that the code is kind of like over here. So it's kind of garbage code, but it wants to go in this direction. So next time I just start here and then I get it to the direction much, much faster. So it's a kind of like long-term iterative process um, that I want to encourage by not falling in love with the prototypes. I'm not saying the idea or something, the information you get from the prototype is very important, but the actual code you write, not so much. Do you do these like decisions, like, you know, um, how to say like consciously or like it just happens like after like, you know, two months that you just leave it or like, said, okay, now I will leave this prototype and yeah. move on or. It's, uh, I mean, it's a mix, you know, it's a, uh, intuitive intuitive is the wrong word it's probably it makes me look too good it's probably that the product the thing is that i i know where i want to take the prototype but i cannot it doesn't work you know i, I cannot push it further in this current iteration because the basic setup is kind of in the wrong place so then it just the 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 progress slows down so much that i feel like i should put it away and give it some time to breathe this was the the, the game that i'm working on now this was the first time this really kind of like worked on a long scale. Otherwise it always is like a shorter iteration times. Um, mm -hmm. and, and in between that, when you like let, let's say, let go of prototypes, do you also like show it in between the time when you? It is uh, different. It depends. The first, like the from, from Geballer, which is uh, uh, next, next week, I will talk about this game a lot. Um, the first prototype was public I show to a discord server and they like it a lot and they play it a lot and I'm like hey this is very cool and since then and since this first version I know the core principle works for the audience and then there is like seven months of not showing the prototypes to anyone and like not not um, like not giving them to people to play because I feel like I know the basic thing works there is just all of this other stuff that I have to test out for myself but this is you know this is very personal uh, stuff. This is not general advice, I think. Other people will tell you you should always test all the time. I like to be a little bit more private, but yeah. Okay. Like Perfect. a test, test with a test audience. Sorry. Hmm. Okay. Moving on. Uh, next question. Uh, any tips on letting prototypes go? We always want to build on everything, so now we're sitting on like 50 things that are a few weeks into development. Yes. But you already let go. You know, this is the kind of thing that happens automatically uh, when the process, when the, when, when the when the speed of development starts to slow down. When you stop to gain any um, benefits on your, what's it? There's an expression for it, whatever. Um, because you sit on fifty things, right? So you have obviously let go of forty nine things uh, already. <laughs> um, the tip is to <sighs> let go harder <laughs> to, 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 to kind of like set the time maybe um, to do like a one hour game jam or something. Um, but if you have 50 things that are a few weeks into development, the problem is, I think, different. Um, the problem is not with letting the prototype go, but with finding a kind of general motivation to finish the game. And this is exactly what I will talk about next time. So if I understand this question correctly, I will Hopefully, I can help you next week. Um, yeah. Cool. So be sure to like tune in the next week also to don't miss out on all of the yes. valuable tips. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so you so we get a good uh, CPI or something? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess that's what I have to see. <laughs> um, okay. 
Uh, next question. Do you show these prototypes on public community Discord servers or servers with friends or other developers? Um, I used to, this, this, this is my, my personal development in this regard is I used to put everything on Twitter, which is why I have two hours of the kind of GIFs. And then when something gets likes, I kind of work more on it and it's a, I, it's a way of work I don't want to do anymore. And so I become more and more private. I become more and more kind of removed. Um, and I used to show like everything I make, like in a private discord with like the, the, the developers who started at the same time as me that I mentioned before. And I just post every day, like two free gifts and it's just crazy, crazy. And now I do this also a lot less. Um, and I just try to be more critical of it myself and to not rely on other people's opinions so much. Um, but this is, you know, it's a kind of like thing, obviously. I don't need, this is also, I have to say this, I got a lot of attention from showing the GIFs. So I don't feel the need to get the attention anymore because I already have it. So if I say, oh, you don't need the attention, that's garbage. You obviously kind of need to make this experience for yourself. <laughs> um, I would recommend you to find a group of, of people on your uh, level of skill and to, to show it with them and to look at their stuff as well. This is the best thing I can recommend in this regard. That's definitely, I think, really like a mature and like uh, experienced like answer, you know, like that's, it, I mean, at least I see that you went through a lot of like, you know, let's say periods, how to say it, like, you yes. know, from <laughs> now, uh, now you, you came to like some state that you're like, I guess, happy with yourself and happy with interaction. <laughs> uh, it's... Or, or uh, I'm just now assuming. Uh... No, 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 it's true. It's connected to money and recognition and just generally a lot of the drive I had for making so many gifts on Twitter was just low self-esteem because mm -hmm. I think that uh, my life is very bad and I need to, for people on the internet to like me. <laughs> so this was a lot of drive to waste a lot of my time with mm -hmm. making things look good instead of understanding how the game actually works at a very basic level. Um, and I think this is a kind of, yeah, I hear this a lot from people who have very low self-esteem and then pull, pull, pull themselves into the work so that they can have self-esteem again. It's a bad thing. But how do I have high self-esteem? I cannot tell you. <laughs> I don't know. I just, luckily, I, I make it out of that. Mm. Th thanks for that answer. It's really, uh, <laughs> it's really I mean, also like inspiring and like, you know, uh, like, uh, psychological and eye-opening. <laughs> um, OK. Uh, next question. Aren't you afraid you've let go of a great potential game because you put it away out of principle? If it's a really great potential game, I do not forget it. I keep the information in my head. If I have a, like, this is another, maybe I can talk about this as well. It will be hard to fit. Um, I have been thinking about like immersive sims for maybe six months now like the genre of immersive simulators, like on the side kind of thing. And I had this very crazy idea about like how to make a platforming immersive simulator. And it was crazy. And I make a prototype and the prototype is garbage and I stop it, you know, because I realize ah, it doesn't work. But the idea and how that prototype looks, the best moment of the prototype I can remember. And the best moment of the prototype I can go and I can play. So now I make a new version of it and I really like it. Um, and all of the bad stuff, I kind of forget. Ah, this this is connects to the thing from before, where all of the bad stuff doesn't get a good name. All of the bad stuff is still called whoop -whoop -whoop, right? So if I if I really like it, I will work on it again and give it a good name. <laughs> so then it will be more easy to find later. Hmm. Do you also like um, how to say? How do you like store all of these like you know let's say memories or like ideas or uh, or uh, like, you know, this kind of like moments of like good prototypes to have like some kind of like system or like, uh... no, <laughs> no, you have okay. seen this. I will not show it to the public, but you have seen my desktop before. This is how my, all my organization looks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's because it's an interactive moment of great joy. Mm -hmm. I think that it stays in my head. Like I remember from the immersive sim prototype from the first one, uh, where you can pick up a kind of like a trampoline, like it's a little thing and you can jump on it and it will bounce you up. And you can pick it up and you can throw it 
And if you throw it on another trampoline, it will bounce further. And I was like, oh, I didn't progress. This is amazing. And so I remember this moment very clearly. And I'm like, oh, this is, you know, this is where, where I have to go. And then I can, I can I, I give it a name. And I now know the name of this prototype and I can look it up. Nice. Um, there is no organization. There's probably a lot of great potential stuff lost. But it's better to lose things with great potential than to invest two years in something with great potential without being 100% sure mm -hmm. it has great potential. So by kind of like letting all this stuff kind of like go away, I, it's a kind of filtration process to make sure only the things that, I don't know if it's great, right? It just, I just know it interests me. Um, and then I don't, I don't forget those. It's like a river. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> uh, the next it's not a question more like a comment I guess uh, yeah uh, oh, this is uh, every wall um, Rock Novak played every wall and found the message very compelling regarding game design and otherwise yeah this was uh, it's, 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 a, it's a game about uh, a, a little character who wants to be able to do everything and then in the end of the game it can actually do everything. And as soon as you can do everything, you lose the idea of perspective and like what is up and what is down and everything looks the same. And, you know, you can do everything, but why does it matter? Um, it was part of the kind of like reflection process of like me trying to get out of the low self-esteem thing where I think that I have to do everything to be a valuable human. Because when you actually achieve everything you want to achieve, suddenly there is nothing you can hold on to. So that is what I try to express with that game, which is also, I guess, you know, in this talk a little bit. Yeah, that, that's really good. Uh, good message. I mean, uh, yeah. If, if you, if I think, if you achieve something really quickly, then I guess you lose motivation on the long run, like to. to yeah, or like to go forward. Yeah, it's it's very very personal. But like, I wanted to go viral on Twitter, and then I went viral on Twitter. And I still had no money and uh, had a shit life. It's like it is this kind of moment where it's like, what do I actually want? You know, like is this really all I all I can dream of? Is this the most I can I can imagine? It's kind of sad. That's that's mm -hmm. the kind of very. It took many years to process this in, uh, emotion. But it's not it's not that related to to prototyping. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay. I think that was the last comment. I'm going to do like one more, like, let's say, call for uh, last uh, um, questions. If anybody has any more last questions, if not, um, I'm going to also post like homework on the, our Discord channel. And you can check all of the links to like the website, to Discord channel, and all of the social media down below. Um, and please don't forget be at the same time same place next week uh, we're gonna continue with the prototyping uh, topic and as already like uh, josh like hinted and mentioned like it's gonna be like you will get more um answers and more tips sorry more, you, more no no more answers and more tips sorry <laughs> yeah uh, i will i will talk about concrete examples and not so much abstract theory i just think this is true what i say today and if i just show you how i work without the foundation it's yeah yeah but next next time i will show you funny gifs <laughs> yeah, yeah um so yeah and oh we have one more less i guess less question and then we're gonna slowly end up this stream so the last question is did you get any invitations from big companies not big companies, but from companies. I got an invitation to be a prototyper for a company. And I got level design job offers and a creative director job offer. And some of it I try out and I realize I really, it's not, it's not big, like, it's not like EA that like nobody knows who I am, right? It's like people from the indie space um, who, uh, find me on Twitter in the in the period where I post a lot of stuff. And I realize the way in which I want to work is very different from this. So I actually try to be
become a prototyper as a like real job and i realized it stresses me so much I, even before i started the job i had a huge nervous breakdown basically um because i was like how can i be creative for someone else you know this is the, this is this is why my perspective is so different because this is normal for every every like most of the people who do the master classes here work in a company setting i this is my company setting you know there's some pixel art on the wall back there but this is not a, a huge production um so i did get offers but it scares me a lot <laughs> and i i will and when, when, when i tried it when I, when I actually did try it i was very bad at it as well <laughs> uh, <laughs> That, that is quite a good good insight. Like, not, it's really, it's like really hard to be creative and to have like constant output, like each and every day, and like you know to be, yeah, how to say, it? it's hard to like master creative. Some days, some days you just don't have it. I mean, some days you have like spikes, and some days no. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when it's only me, like, you know, I'm kind of responsible for my life. So if I fuck up, okay. But the, the the idea of being like of someone counting on me that I didn't pick, I don't know. It's strange because eventually I want to go in this direction, but this is going completely off topic. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. Did you <laughs> want to? Did you want to? No, finish, please. Uh. Thanks. Thanks for all the questions. It's very fun uh, to answer. If I if I can have the, the the last word, I would like to reiterate the messages. Go ahead. And go ahead. So what's important about today is that prototypes are interactive tests that you throw away, that exploring exploratory prototyping is about the fundamental qualities of video games, like how things just work on a kind of atomic level, and that making a map of the possibility space is very cool. And that's it. <laughs> see, you. see you next week. Yeah, thank you, Josh, uh, for the presentation. And yeah, see you next week, same time.